We are thrilled and honored to have her with us. Um, she's back after her wonderful lectures in February 2020 before the pandemic changed so many things in the world. Um, the second lecture in the series is titled Mobilizing Chola and Maratha Pasts, Sarpuji <laughs> II's reinvention of the Great Temple at Tanjavur. My apologies to those who were at the first lecture today. I have been instructed to introduce Professor Peterson again for those who were not there. So please bear with me. Uh, Professor Peterson is a scholar of classical Sanskrit and Tamil literature and Hinduism, who has published widely on South Indian literary, social, and cultural history and, and the performing arts. She's also interested in translation, European Indian culture contact, and comparative literature. As I said earlier, and as we witnessed in the earlier lecture, one of the most remarkable features of her scholarship is the wide range of languages she works in, from classical languages, her PhD from Harvard was in Sanskrit and Indian studies, and Tamil, stretching back to the Alvars and earlier poets of the sixth century, to modern South and North Indian languages, including Hindi and Marathi, having grown up in Bombay. An accomplished singer and exponent of Carnatic music, Music seems to be a kind of centering principle around which much of her scholarship revolves. She ended the last lecture with um, a Mozart opera and its connections to uh, the company paintings of Tanjavur. And I, I, think it, I believe it is an interest she shared with her late husband. I remember discussing a Monteverdi opera with him. <laughs> um, tomorrow's lecture is also on music. It's on violins and venas. European and Indian music at the court of King Sarfoji of Tan Tanjore. Among her many publications, I should mention her, I've mentioned two, uh, the groundbreaking poems to Shiva, the hymns of the Tamil saints, and one that's very relevant today, the great temple at Tanjavur, a thousand years, written with George Michel. A complete list of her publications is on our website. She is currently working on two books, one on the Tanja Renaissance and one on operatic drama at the Tan Tanjavur Maratha court. So over to Professor Indira Vishwanathan Peterson uh, to take us to Sarfoji II's Tanjavur. Good evening, everyone. Um, I already said in my other talk uh, that it's a real pleasure to be back at the Bangalore International Center. As Pratiti mentioned, I was here in 2020 and gave two lectures on the Tanjaur uh, Kingdom of the Marathas. So it is a pleasure to speak uh, uh, to an audience or rather share with an audience uh, my um, ongoing work on the Tanjaur what I call the Tanja Renaissance, um, uh, because you all are such an interested audience. You know, you are here because you are interested, you have very broad interests. And uh, my sister Bhavani Rangan, who's here, and we were talking about that. We both live in the US, and it's a real pleasure for us to come here to cities like Bangalore, where there is a wide variety of people, not necessarily academics, but people who are just interested and um, not interested simply in terms of nationalistic pride or some kind of narrow view, but with a broad international view and the cosmopolitan view. And that is the greatest pleasure of all. So thank you all for being here. And I would love to, uh, to share this, um, my work on Sarfoji and the Tanjavur Temple now. So here you have an image that I juxtaposed um, of an oval, a portrait oval. Uh, it wasn't actually an oval, it was just a portrait. As well as it has been. My book will be dedicated, it was going to be dedicated entirely to him, but now that I've lost my husband and daughter, it's going to be a joint dedication because they too were instrumental in my doing everything I'm doing. So uh, I wanted to see if Avantika were here. I hope uh, she was there for the earlier talk and that she comes again. Uh, or perhaps tomorrow. She's in Bangalore, and uh, I knew her as a young girl, so I'm very delighted uh, to know that she's here. 
Uh, I, and I wanted to acknowledge Babaji Raju because he has wonderful help in, in, in my doing the research, both at Saraswati Mahal and elsewhere on Punjabi and so forth. So uh, now we can. Uh, oh, yes, the juxtaposition was of a portrait that was done around, I think I know the exact date, 1801 by uh, an Italian um, artist called Anna Tonelli, who was the governess of the two daughters of Lord Clive, not the older Clive, whose, whose exploits we know so well, but his son, Edward Clive, who was, who was appointed governor of Madras at that time. And his wife, Lady Clive, brought his, her two daughters, Henrietta and uh, uh, Charlotte, I may have the name wrong, uh, her two daughters and their governess, Anna, to meet Sir Foji, the young Sir Foji, who had just, uh, as you know, he reigned, or you will know, that he reigned from 1798 to 1832. So this was just early in his reign, a young man. There you see him as a young man. And it is about that period that I'm going to be talking about. And then the juxtaposition is with a somewhat earlier painting, very famous painting by uh, Thomas uh, William Daniel of um, the Bradishwara Temple. And as you can see, it looks bare with almost no people in it, you know, and possibly the people that have been added or who knows what. And you, you never know with the Daniels because they, if they want to show the picturesque, they could, um, you know, show it any way they want. And if the people are to be shown this way, and also um, another person criticized the painting for the fact that it shows uh, the, the this, Mandapam here, the pillars are all wrong in terms of proportion. So they could imagine what if they wanted. So it's a very interesting image of the Radishwara temple. But what is most interesting about it is, of course, this idea of a temple almost in ruins, a very ancient temple, a picturesque temple, which was the signature uh, characteristic of most European painters of the time who saw ancient monuments and India itself as a picturesque ruin. And this king, Sarfoji II of Tanjore, whom we shall meet, uh, did something else with it. Now, the temple that we know uh, as Raja Radhishwam, and now I shall read, um, in 1010 AD, on the 275th day of his 25th uh, regnal year, the Chora king Raja Raja I dedicated a gold plated copper pot finial, a kalasha, to be placed on the colossal granite stoopy slab, um, uh, which you see up there, stoopy slab, um, that crowned the 216 foot sanctuary tower of the granite temple here erected to Shiva at his capital, Tanjavu, glorifying his god and celebrating his own imperial sway in South India and Southeast Asia. Meticulously planned in every detail, this impressive Raja Rajeshwaram, Temple of Raja Raja's Lord, was an impressive royal monument in its day and continues to be an architectural marvel, stunning in its immense scale and perfect proportions, from the 14-story Vimana Tower to its elegant ornamentation to the massive Linga uh, image of Shiva ensconced in the sanctum called Brihad Ishvara because of the size and the colossal uh, scale of the Linga, later translate, translated into Tamil as Peruvudaya, the great law of the great law. So and the temple itself became the great temple, or in today called just the big temple. I look into the big temple. They don't say Raja Rajeshwara or Brahmishwara, big temple. So there's the big temple. Um, and you will see the later in a minute. The scale, a very sparsely populated temple, even though after 1010 AD, in the time of fragmented kingdoms of Pandavas and uh, uh, Pandyas, then the Nayakas and others, many small shrines were added to them, one of which is the wonderful, uh, I mean, the Chandikeshwara shrine is old, uh, the Nataraja, I mean, there are some shrines that are old, the Brihan Nayaki is um, much enlarged, the Nandi Pavilion is a Nayaka edition, and the Subramanya shrine is entirely Nayaka, the Ganapati shrine was rebuilt by Sarfoji. So basically you have an enormous uh, campus with very few uh, buildings, which is completely the opposite of how we see 
uh, the great temples like Madurai, Sri Ranga, colossal cities, multiple gopurams and gateways, all of which were perhaps, you know, I mean, uh, rather, which may have been founded during Pallava or Chola or Pandya times in the early 6th or 7th or 8th centuries and the 10th, 11th and 12th, but were added on especially in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. So temples changed, Rajaraja's temple changed, but the biggest change of all came in the conceptualization of that temple during the 19th century, during Sarkoji's time. And that's what I'm going to talk about. There are many, many books about Rajaraja's temple because it is the first colossal uh, structural uh, South Indian temple of its kind in granite. And so, and even though there are earlier Chola temples and they are there, but the size of it and the proportions and all of that make it a remarkable monument. So let me talk a little bit about that as soon as I show you a few more images of Rajaraja's temple. A famous Nataraja image, Chola period, um, all the images on the outer, prakara, when you walk around in the outer prakara, this is what you see. There is this famous Kalantaka image where on the left side you see uh, Yama coming to get Markandeya who is praying here, I'm not so sorry, who is praying here holding on to the linga and taking refuge in Shiva and Shiva with his beautiful uh, woman's earring and man's earring, you know, he is kicking death to death right here. And this is what the uh, Tamil Shaiva saints on whom I wrote my first book and someone asked me if I could sing from the, the hymns and that's what you hear in these temples. So I'll sing the very first of the Tevaram hymns, this one by the first saint Sambandha, uh, 6th or 7th century. And uh, it describes Shiva not in this pose, but uh, as, as uh, Shiva who came to bless him and give him the gift of poetry. Todu daya chariyan vinaye rivor tu vanmadi chodi Kaadudaya shudalai bodi pusiyan ullamukka vakal vamma Yedudaya malaranun nalpani tetavarul chayda Pidudaya piramam purame in the Raga Nate or in the old uh, scale uh, called the Pan in Tamil, uh, it is an equivalent of Nate. I'm sorry my voice, coffee was terrible for it and I'm sorry I drank the coffee because I shouldn't be singing. Anyway, I'm not going to dwell on Raja Raja, just to show the magnificence of the temple. You can see the different murtis, the different kinds of Chola period ornamentation and most important of all, these great Tamil inscriptions that go all the way around the base and the uh, sides of the temple and other colonnades and elsewhere. So let me just talk about that a little bit and then I'll move on to Sarfoji. So, um, the, among the most striking feature, okay, this is what I said. This paper is about the multiple parts of this thousand year old monument, uh, more than thousand now, and about the ways in which the monument has itself been instrumental in the mobilization of these parts. I focused on a particular moment in the early 19th century when another ruler of Tanjavu engaged with the Brihadishwara temple and its past as the avenue to an invention of a dynamic future for himself and his kingdom under colonial domination. And that's what I want to talk about. But before that, I want to pick up from an article that I wrote for a recent book published by Westland Press. It's called Where the Gods Well, 13 uh, in temples and their his stories. And uh, in this, I talked about the revival or the retrieval of the Chola past in, in the 20th century and the 21st century, some of which we you know from the famous now celebrated film by Mani Ratna, Pony in Selvan. <laughs> of course, Pony in Selvan's antecedents were an earlier retrieval by Kalki, the famous writer, Kalki Krishnamurti, who had studied Rajaraja's inscriptions and everything, but how could he study the inscriptions? Well, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Eugen Hulch, the epigraphist for South India, a German scholar, 
and his assistant, really a brilliant assistant, and who became the next epigraphist, uh, V. Venkaya, a very celebrated scholar, both of them cracked this particular version of the old Chola Tamil script. There were others, uh, other inscriptions which had been read, but this one hadn't been read to, uh, hadn't been published till 19, uh, the 19, early 19, 1900s. And then in our era, uh, I'm jumping forward, we now have them all digitized. So any of you can read Raja Raja's inscription and I'll say why it is such an important inscription. But uh, once that was done, the grandest grand structural temple, temple in the Dravida style, this magnificent abode of Shiva was placed on UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites in 1987 and is one of South India's premier tourist attractions. Um, and then I talked about the, this, these retrievals. Um, the, um, I will back to the end of my article where I talk about uh, this. Please give me a moment while I find it. Um, a celebrated panorama photograph by Linnaeus Tribe. Um, do I have that? Yes, this is the panorama photo. Um, it's the, called 1858, inscription of uh, around the basement of the Great Pagoda at Tanjore, 1858, an album in silver print by Linnaeus Tribe. And uh, this photograph was actually used as one of the sources for cracking the code because it was a very long uh, panorama which allowed them to read the entire inscription in various parts of it. Now, uh, it underscores the enigmatic quality of these inscriptions. Ironically, not long after it was made, Tribe's image was folded into the project of cracking that enigma, right? And it was published, uh, epigraphists published it. These, along with other texts and artifacts, stimulated the study of Chola history and art. By the 1930s, the big temple became the premier space for experiencing the Tamil past. A Raja Raja Chola Museum was established at the temple. Raja Raja's birthday was celebrated as Founders Day. A statue of the king was set up in the temple precincts. And the acme of these activities was the publication in 1935 of historian K. A. Nilakanta Shastri's The Cholas in multiple volumes. But it was the great modern writer Kalki's epic historical novel, Pony and Shelvan, that serially published in the 1950s that brought the romance of Raja Raja and the Cholas to the Tamil public, just as Walter Scott's novels had conjured up the milieu of the Scottish Highlanders for his audience. I would not go on about this except to say that in 2010, a plethora of books were written on the temple because of the uh, thousandth anniversary. One of them is uh, George Michel's Impeccable Architectural History of the Temple, along with my introduction to a uh, very brief introduction to the temple uh, with Bharat Ramamutham's wonderful photos. The reason we do not claim any originality except for my work on the Marathas for this book is that the Choras, there have been so many wonderful books written on the Choras well before and including uh, at this anniversary. Now, the, uh, uh, the topic that I am now speaking on is, of course, sorry, I have to bend over to get this, it's a little bit of acrobatics here. Um, so, uh, the, these, are the, these are the inscriptions that cover, that virtually cover the walls of the temple. One of these is uh, runs along the base of the Vimana in 107 paragraphs, recording royal gifts to the shrine and provisions made for the ritual. And uh, I, for ritual, but uh, I don't want to go on and on about it, but you can read about it yourselves. However, uh, late 19th, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm uh, repeating something here, so please let me uh, put on a little more light, maybe, because I'm having a little trouble seeing my paper here. Um, so, uh, Serfoji played, yeah, uh, I argue here that in early, early 19th century uh, Tanjavu, Serfoji, who ruled Tanjavu under British colonial supervision from 1798 to 1832, recentered Maratha sovereignty and reinvented the Brihadishwara temple. How did he do it? Through textualization, construction, ritual, and artistic performance. Sarfoji played an important role in mobilizing the Tanjau temple's Chola past and several other heritages as well. 
and recasting them for colonial modernity. What follows is my reconstruction of Zerfoji's project, aiming at tracing his contribution to our recent histories of rememberings and forgettings of the Brihadishwara temple's history. So, uh, I'm not going to read now. I'm going to just summarize what Zerfoji did in general. Um, <coughs> so you have Daniel, you have Tribe, and Zerfoji. So here is a, oval, a real oval portrait of him given to the King of Denmark, circa 1800. Um, and then the Anatomy portrait. I'm not going to dwell on this because I have a lot to say. Map of Maratha Tanjau, which is basically the whole Tanjau, former Tanjau district, um, and uh, including Trichnopoli and other areas. And by Serfoji's time, all that was left to him because the British had taken over, as uh, and he was a subsidiary ally of the British. The contract allowed him, the treaty allowed him to only be lord over the uh, city of Tanjau, which was inside the fort, and then the smaller fort in which the Brihadishwara temple was encircled by. Saifoti received an education from Christian Friedrich Schwarz, a German missionary, Protestant missionary, among the Protestant missionaries who had settled very early in India, in South India, and used Tanjore as their base for a long time. This was as early as the uh, 1705, where they were in Trampubar and then they came to Tanjore through Schwartz in the 1770s. So Schwartz's deathbed scene was a flaxman sculpture by the most eminent neoclassical sculpture in England, uh, which was established by Serfoji in Schwartz's church because Schwartz taught him enlightenment knowledge and uh, helped him with his contract with the Europeans. Serfoji's uh, legitimacy was contested because he was adopted and the case went on for more than 10 years. His uncle Amar Singh had taken over as first as regent and then as king. And Sarfoji finally got the throne in 1798 through British uh, uh, grace. So he was very beholden to them. And therefore he was, um, and he also got this very interesting education well before Indians had access to Indian English education. And one of the things that attracted him to all of this was his passion for uh, enlightenment knowledge systems. And he then created what I call the Tanjore Renaissance, where he combined uh, ideas from the European Enlightenment and the great tradition of uh, Chola, Nayaka, and uh, Maratha uh, uh, knowledge systems, which were archived in the Saraswati Mahan Library. So today, the Saraswati Mahan Library has two major libraries Sarfoji's European Library of 4,000 volumes and then all of Saraswati Mahal with all the languages of the time, Telugu, Marathi, Tamil, Sanskrit, uh, manuscripts of every kind, and publications as well. An anatomy, European anatomy text in Marathi translation, Sanskrit, elephant signs, Gaja Shastra, there are about 27 manuscripts on Gaja Shastra, all illustrated, both in Sanskrit and Marathi. Uh, Goddess Saraswati in company painting, and uh, so it goes. Uh, he was interested in European architecture. He wrote a, uh, band tunes and had the first wind band, full-fledged wind band in India. Uh, he um, sent objects and received objects, Copenhagen, Haller, Tanjore, uh, to uh, Calcutta, London and Madras, uh, and so on. So this circulatory uh, connections with Europeans and Indians. Um, 4,000 books, Gibbon's Decline and Fall, Humboldt's Voyage in the Equinoctial Regions, uh, Me in the Saraswati Mahal, 1993, beginning my research. You see the polyglossia there. Uh, Tamil, Telugu, uh, Sanskrit, everything is there. The first translation of Aesop into an Indian language, complete translation, Bala Bodha Muktavali, the Tanjore Aesop, with woodcuts done in the quasi European style at his own printing press, the first major private Devanagari press in India, uh, in South India, sorry. Uh, he claims multiple pasts and identities, as I said, through the Brihadishwara temple. So let me go through the journey uh, and what he did uh, and why he did it. 
Between 18, uh, so what I say here is, Sarkoji's engagement with the temple, notable for the sheer mass and scale of activity, began at the very inception of his reign and was sustained throughout his life. That's, you know, quite a few years. Like everything else in his career, it must be read in the context of his role as a pioneer of South Indian modernity and an important figure in the histories of global encounter in the 19th century. Let us look at the specifics of his initiatives. First, recentering sovereignty at the Tanjao temple. Remember, uh, I don't want to use words like hollow crown or ritual sovereignty. As far as he was concerned, he was a king. Everybody called him Raja. Tanjore Raj is still a word that is used. So let's forget about those kinds of distinctions and just say he was establishing his sovereignty as a king. What kind of a king? Chola king. Because the Nayakas, the Pandyas, and all of the people who ruled in Tanjore before the Marathas, and certainly all the Marathas called themselves Chola Bhupati, rulers of the Chola. Historical memory was of the imperium of the Cholas, and that is why they called them. So then this was Chola Nadu. This was Chola Nadu in town. So this was very important. Between 1801 and 1803, Sarfoji carried out extensive projects of construction and renovation. And I will tell you why in just a minute. The Subramanya Shrine was renovated to some extent. Remember I said it's a Nayaka period, a beautiful temple. Uh, these sculptures were damaged, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. And they were on the, uh, the Shikara, and the, they were repaired by uh, artisans from Sarfoji's court, I mean Sarfoji's time, between 1801 and 1803, a few years after his ascension. The Nandi Bull Pavilion, that was continually worshipped at that time and is still one of the greatest attractions in the temple. We shall meet this Nandi again a little further in my talk. Uh, the Ganesha Shrine, Maharashtrians were very fond of Ganapati Bapa Moria, so they, <laughs> Sir Foji's favorite thing was to completely rebuild the Chola period shrine and he put a Marathi style Ganapati, Marathi Tamil style Ganapati in there. And uh, he had images from the, uh, this is uh, this is probably from the um, the Tiruvidayadal Puranam or the Halasya Mahatmya, the, the stories of Meenakshi, the, the, sorry, the 64 uh, games of Shiva in Madurai. So the Madurai temple things were uh, uh, put in murals on the colonnades of the temple, Rajaraja's temple. And then on the ceilings of the Devi shrine, you see here a full-fledged Maratha-style Devadasi dance going on uh, for Devi. And Ganapati is sitting on the right-hand side. I don't know if you can. There's Devi. This is the Devi Mahatmya. Devi is sitting there. And here are turbaned, Maratha turbaned uh, Natuvanas and musicians. And here is the Devadasi in entirely Bharatanatyam style or Sadr style. And there is Garapati watching this. These are Maratha period, Sarfoji period murals. And then later, his, his son Shivaji uh, placed murals, which we don't have pictures of here, of the entire dynasty of the Marathas in Tanjavu in the Subramanya shrine colony. But now we come, and, and the most important thing he did was 108 lingas established by him in the colony after a pilgrimage of all of Chorana of, of the time. And that is what I would like to talk about. Texts, rites, performances, processions, poems, dance, song, inscriptions, histories, paintings, and drawings. That's a whole lot. So, uh, this, these were some of the construction things that he did, which I'll just mention. He performed purifying rituals, repaired and rebuilt the shrines I mentioned, consecrated the 108 lingas brought from many sacred places in the Kaveri Delta, valuable jewelry gifted to the deities and shrines, and here's an interesting point, Marathi inscriptions engraved on jewels, flagstones, pavements, walls, recorded the rites, gifts, renovations, and other constructions. Remember, the Raja Raja inscriptions are the same thing. They are recording everything that was done for the temple. And Sir Foji in 1801 or 1804 does the same thing. At that time, that inscription had not been deciphered. So this is just this kind of gut feeling. He saw this inscription. He likes it. And how do you become a Chola monarch? 
you you make inscriptions, but you do it in Marathi, which is very peculiar, considering that Marathi was not the principal language of uh, the Jaur, although it was a very important royal language. And I would stress the word royal. The court was focusing on Marathi a great deal as an official language. And I think that that's why Sir Fuji put that there. But there are other reasons that I will get to towards the end of my talk. So, one inscription states, for example, that he gave Rhadishwara and his goddess in 1798 on its ascension. Uh, the goddess gets an emerald pendant, a string of pearls set in gold lace, a conch set with silver and gold work, a crown and a sheath, tailored dresses equipped with hooks, Gujarati bolusu anklet, toe rings and a tali wedding necklace strung with 108 small shivalingas and silver. So this echoes, as we shall see, if you read the Rajaraja inscription, he talks about every single gift that was given to every single deity in the British were uncanny resonances. And, and uh, he made this great pilgrimage, and that's what I want to kind of just list here. Sharabhendra Tirthavali, the sequence of King Sarfoji's sacred places of pilgrimage, was a Marathi poem by a court poet. Then he does a Tamil translation of a Sanskrit Purana text, the glorification of the Gradishwara temple, Gradishwara Mahatmya, and all at the same time. <laughs> then he places in 1804, he finishes this inscribing this long historical narrative about the Bhosle dynasty starting well before Shivaji Bhosle and going through Shivaji and coming to the Tanjavar Marathas that it's a genealogical history and it is placed on the walls of the colonnade where the lingas are placed. So this is very interesting. Nothing of this sort had been done before. I should also make another point. Stone inscriptions of this kind were not very popular in, South, in that part of South India around this time, not in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Copper plates were more popular because copper plates could be stored secretly and kept and they were used as uh, for land grants and various other things. The stone inscriptions that the Cholas and the Pallavas did was royal magnificence, but uh, that wasn't done by these later kings. So why then is Sarfoji so focused on stone inscriptions in his temple? This is one of the questions I asked. And why a Maratha history in this Tamil temple? That's another question. In Marathi, which most of the people don't read, the courtiers read it, some others read it. Tamil, Telugu and Sanskrit texts were of a different order. The Tanja Perumudaya Ula, the festival procession of Shiva uh, as Pradeshwara, is an Ula poem. And Ula is a classical Tamil poem dating to the Chola era. The most famous procession, the Ula means procession. The procession poems were dedicated to the Chola kings. Ottakuta wrote a trilogy to Vikrama Chora, Kulotunga and Varma Chora. And those were the models for all later Ulas. But this Ula poem is in classical Tamil and he needed a great classical poet to write it. So it wasn't as if he was just focusing on Marathi. He got a court poet to write. He hired Sivakurundu Deshika, who was a very famous Tamil scholar, and he asked him to write this Ula and it was written for Pradeshwara, the first one written to Pradeshwara. And we will get to why this temple did not have as many texts before as many other temples do. Madurai, for example, I just mentioned the 64 deeds of Shiva, it's right there, it's very famous. Madurai also has Tala Puranas. This Brihadishwara Purana that I mentioned earlier was a very late uh, Purana. There was no earlier Purana for this temple. So the question arises, why were there no great texts associated with this temple? I mentioned that I sang from the songs of the Pallava period saints in Tamar over 900 poems to Shiva for every like 270 temples in Tamar Nadu in Sri Lanka, Viradishwara temple is not one of them. So, I, of course, it wouldn't be because it was too early. I was going to say it's chronologically not possible. But why didn't more people write more songs to Viradishwara at that time? There were a few especially a famous one by Karur Devar, who's enshrined in this temple, um, but uh, not comparable with any other temple where there are many, many texts written for the temple. So this is an enigma which we need to solve. The next uh, one, those of you who came to my previous talk, as well as the talk in 2020, have heard me mention 
the Kuramanji fortune teller drama of King Sharabhendra, which was a fortune teller drama, which we'll see in a minute, featuring him as the hero. And this is very uh, bold because Bradishwar as the great lord, the thing should be written for him. Instead, Sir Foji is the hero and his name is in the title. But on the other hand, many of the descriptions are about the great lord and his magnificence. So it was a kind of, I'm the, the servant of the lord and I'm pay, praised here, but I praise him. That kind of thing. So, and written for enactment by David Dawson's at the Bradishwara Temple on the occasion of his annual festival. Also by the same Shiva Kurundadeshi, the Tamil poet. And then you know the millions of dance, millions is an exaggeration, hundreds, thousands of dance and musical compositions, especially of the famous Tanjore Quartet of Dance Masters and Composers, Ponnaya, Chinnaya, Vadipelu, and Shivanandam, whose compositions are still sung today and dance today, on Lord Viradishwara, so that they were focused on the temple, the court and the temple, so the two were connected. The last are the musical compositions by the Carnatic musicians and composers, far fewer, but still they are there. Muthuswami Dikshitar, Yagaraja, not Yagaraja, sorry, Muthuswami Dikshitar writes about uh, the Viradishwara. And then now we look at specifics of these texts. First, about his Cholanadu pilgrimage. Um, so, what I want to say in conclusion about this list that I gave you just now, because a list doesn't make much sense unless you can think about it in analytic ways, um, the, uh, I'm making the point that apart from the, yeah, in, in the first quarter of the 19th century, Sarfuji re-centered Maratha sovereignty of the Bradishwara temple by invoking imperial chora, temple and ritual related, that is agamic, Tamil, that is, that is establishing the lingas and worshipping and so on. Tamil Shaiva <coughs> devotional bhakti poetry, which is the Shiva Kaur and the poems. And Maratha genealogical pasts and identities, as well as, as you shall see, popular local traditions and European antiquarian discourses, such as those of Thomas Daniel, Lord Valencia and others. So this is the structure of my talk. I'm going to get into each of these invocations of an identity, a relationship with a different kind of discourse about the temple through a particular genre of literature or a form of art or something like that. Mostly literature because that's my favorite, that's my specialist. But I also feel that these texts have never been studied carefully or very little studied in part because of the rupture of the polyglot nature of the South Indian ecumene of the 19th century. Because when linguistic states and divisions came up, people just learned their local languages. Although in places like Bangalore and Hyderabad, I feel that the polyglot world is still very much alive at a, an everyday level. But the literary polyglossy of this period is what is missing. And the performance culture of that period uh, had em embodied this polyglossia, uh, which is still there now, but we don't have that kind of in-depth feeling for those languages and languages. Um, I should also mention that during this period, the Marathas were the last of a, a group of people who ruled uh, Tanjagur, and before them were the illustrious Nayakas about whom Narayana Rao, Shulman, and Subramanian have, have written such a wonderful um, uh, things about how the Nayakas brought Vijayanagar and post Vijayanagar <coughs> culture and created their own, uh, invented their own identities and cultures, mixing Tamil, Telugu, and Sanskrit. Now, here you have the Marathas adding Marathi into the mix, and Sarfoji adding European cultures, enlightenment discourses into that mix. Uh, so, Apart from the scale of the undertaking, what is remarkable is the fact that he was the first king of Tanjavu after Raja Rajeshwara to promote the Bradishwara temple, this is the key, as the principal focus of royal worship uh, and as the royal shrine for the ruler of Tanjavu. And I should say why in just a minute. What drove Sarfoji to claim, uh, to invent tradition by claiming Chora, Maratha and other pasts and engaging European discourses in colonial Tanjavu, and why did the Bradishwara become the principal focus of these claims for a Europeanized ruler, right? In what ways did Sarfoji articulate and negotiate these claims, and how did he, his project transform perceptions of the temple itself? 
Obviously, I'm not going to answer all of those questions here, but I just want to mention them. Very quick summary of why Sarfoji did what he did. First, the symbolic as well as practical constraints and ruptures of titular rule under the British colonial regime played a very important part. Because he was adopted, his legitimacy was contested, so he, had, he was also Europeanized, and this was, these were not very good things from the point of view of the population who wanted a ruler who was embodying tradition. So Sarfoji had to definitely reinstate himself into that role of the traditional dharmic king. And temple renovation, temple support, these are very old ways of doing that. That's one thing. Um, in fact, uh, the uh, Sarfoji had to content himself. The second and most important reason, Tanjavur rulers as well as other rulers went to the 275 and more shrines that the early saints and others had sung and had people worshipped at. When you think of a temple to go to to worship, if you if you are a South Indian, you go to, I mean, of course, Tirupati is there, but in Tamil Nadu, you go to Madurai, you go to Sri Rangam, Dirvanaika, you know, Kumbakonam, Kanchipuram. Whoever goes to Tanjavur to worship, you know, I mean, that is not the cultically important temple, it's the royal temple. So Sarfoji had to do had to sort of invent a very important temple there. Why? Because he had only that temple under his he had other Devastanas under his jurisdiction, but they were outside of the territory that he was really allowed to travel to. So he had to show his glory right there, like Rajaraja. Rajaraja's temple was not worshipped at because his son then went off and built Gange Kondachora Puram, Dara Suram was an older temple. So those temples had antiquity and glory. Rajaraja's temple was his son and grandson, all these people tried to make it a big temple, but it did not win the place of the greatest temple of the Cholas. In fact, Nataraja of Chidambaram and Chidambaram temple itself was the Cholas' most uh, you know, important temple. That's why I showed the Nataraja there. So there is this reason. And then and that's why it became the Royal Shrine Center at this time. And European interventions had affected concrete ruptures as well. Uh, in 1758, the French had unsuccessfully tried to besiege the Tanjavur Temple, the smaller fort the, in which it was situated. And from 1773 to the end of the Mysore Wars and Sarfoji's accession, the fort and the temple had housed an English garrison. Worship had been disrupted. The temple had suffered extensive physical damage. Sarfoji was duty-bound through renovation and reconsecration to repair it and cleanse it. He needed to do the purification. It's called Jirno Dharana and also uh, Shanti. He had to do both of those things. But the Shan's dilapidated conditions in 1801, I suggest, also offered him a major opportunity when he couldn't renovate anything else, he could renovate this great monument and make his name known through his, these deeds. So that is wonderful. And then he had to foreground his Shaiva persona, which is why all those texts and Puranas and Ulas and all of that, which will make you seem, uh, appear to be the kind of traditional ruler. Um, I can say many things, but I will simply say that the rich array of texts that I've mentioned run the gamut of language, genre, and uh, uh, the kinds of work they do, the cultural work they do for Sarfoji's identities. Okay, they mirror, document, legitimate, or celebrate um, uh, performances, comment on and resonate with each other, and bring the many languages of Maratha and into new kinds of conversation, highlighting the heterogeneous audiences, purposes, and discourses. His audiences were multiple. Europeans were his audience, South Indian speakers were his audience, Marathi speakers were his audience, pundits were his audience, so he's doing all of these things. Now, to quickly summarize the six sections, which is going to be, um, it's, it's a feat, but I will do it. Sharabhendra Tethavali, claiming Chola sovereignty, the Chola Nadi pilgrimage. I told you about the 275 shrines of the Kaveri Delta, which is the basic Chola realm. So by circumambulating this Kaveri Delta, it is the metaphor of Digvijaya, which is what a monarch has to do in order to establish himself in territory. It's a very ancient metaphor, and Sarfoji uses it. 
At the same time, he gives um, um, jewelry and prasad you know, and uh, donations and everything to each of these temples. So though the British have forbidden him, except for religious reasons, to go out of the fort, he uses those religious reasons to show himself to the people and establish himself, even though he had no authority and no legitimate uh, claim over those territories, he is their sovereign. That's what he's saying. And the Lingas are brought and established here to, you know, establish the fact that he did that. Uh, I can read, uh, you don't have to look at that, I'll read it out. Uh, Mounted on the horse, Shambhu Prasad, gift of Shiva, the royal lion shone like Indra, king of the gods. This is the poem which describes the pilgrimage blow by blow, every temple that he went to, every present, it's like it's documentation. Every present that he gave to the god and the goddess, what rituals he performed there, which brahmins and who, whom he saw there, all the everything is documented in Marathi. So this would be the courtiers in Marathi, in, who know Marathi would be listening to this poem, which show the glory of the king, like this. Like Indra, king of the gods, thunderbolt wielder, riding on the celestial horse, Uchaishravas, clad in a glittering, uh, yeah, glittering, it's not the picture, but that will do. White silk brocade garment, dark Rudraksha beads gleaming at his throat, and the white ash of Shiva shimmering on his forehead. Surely, he's Lord Shiva himself come to bless the world. When the king reached the Hujur bunk, the Sangeeta Mela, the Nagaswaram band, began to sound, as did the Chandra and Surya Parai, the moon and sun crescent drums, uh, Pirai, sorry, not Parai, because Pirai is the crescent drums, and bards chanted the king's Birudavali, his glorious titles. So, he's not a colonial vassal, he's a glorious monarch. And here's the consecration of the Slingas, how minutely it's described. And I will now anticipate myself and tell you that this description of the establishment of the Lingas is based on a, the Purana, Bradishira Purana's description of a Karikala Chola's establishment of the temple and the consecration of the temple and then consecration of the Linga. It's minutely mirroring the Sanskrit text in Marathi, which is very interesting because those who have read Pony Chalman also know that, well, we all know that Raja Raja established the temple, not Karikala. But there's historical memory here of both the ancient Karikala and then the Aditya Karikala who was in the previous dynasty before Raja Raja. If you read Pony Chalman or see the film, you will be confused, but you will know that these names appear. So this is oral history which is being played here. So. For the consecration of the Lingas, he recruited Shaiva Brahmin priests drawn from an array of textual affiliations and Godras. According to their instructions, new pots with mango leaves were set up looking like pots of ambrosia sheathed by a web of sacred threads. The king had collected 108 fine Lingas whose worship had lapsed. On Wednesday, the fourth day of the lunar fortnight, he had the preceptors perform the sacrificial rites and so it goes. And lastly, on Thursday, the pure fifth day of Vaishakha, under the astral conjunction of the bull, Sharabhendra completed his consecration of the lingas to the music of auspicious instruments. A very beautiful description. And there is uh, then his procession, uh, the god's procession. Now the god is going in procession. Shalfoji is going on procession on his pilgrimage. He starts his pilgrimage. But at the end of the pilgrimage, it's the god who is going on pilgrimage and he is described. This is a company painting from the 1800s uh, showing a Shiva Shiva procession. Uh, and you can see, if you really look closely, you can see um, uh, Marathi uh, saris here, Maharashtrian saris, all kinds of people, Devadasis, uh, Odavas, dancing, you know, dancing here, um, fireworks. This is a festival. Maybe not the Bharateshwara temple, it could be some other temple as some artists, uh, art historians has, have suggested, but it's very similar to Bharateshwara's procession that is described here. The, then uh, Chandeksha, the guardian, the best of Shiva's devotees, rode by his side. The temple car with its three canopies decked with flower garlands looked like male of the cosmic mountain. Lovely dancing women, bright as flashing lightning, danced at each halting place. They have to halt at every street corner and dance right there. 
So all the, uh, the four streets, the streets that you are surround the temple must be traversed. And the king had collected, sorry, I'm sorry, this is from a different one. They carried, here, this, as Brahdishwara approached the Hajari quadrangle, they lit Mahtabi flares whose brilliant light whitened the entire space of earth and heaven like the light of the full moon. They carried hundreds of devotee torches and moonlight lamps. Earth and sky were lit up as if it were the middle of the day. Then they set off rockets of all kinds and firecrackers. The dance of the Devadasis were followed, and the king received blessings and so on the temple's paths. So there's that's just a small example of what the uh, procession already described in this poem. And then there's a whole processional poem. I'm sorry, I had a Nagaswara clip here, but you all have a Nagaswara. You don't need it. This was for European American audiences. Um, that is the procession. And uh, now the Tamarula, I'll only give two seconds to it because I see my time is getting uh, you know, eaten up here. Uh, Chola Ula, I've already mentioned it's a Chola genre. And uh, again, we have a very similar description of the god going in procession. I will just read a very small excerpt from that longer description. Okay, uh, I'll just read one little excerpt from this. You don't have to look at it. I'm looking at it. Um, Brahmins who recite the Vedas and the holy ones who sing the Tamil hymns, the hereditary trustees of the great temple and all the other officials surged forward like the ocean of milk, roaring with sounds of praise and blazing white with the ash smeared on their bodies. And then the king comes and so on. But the Ula poem then establishes him as equal to the Choras for whom these Ulas were written. And uh, at the same time, the God is given the Ula, the procession. He's not the one. Shirafuji is not the one who's going on the procession. It's the God. And the entire poem is about the procession and who's coming and who's seeing it and uh, how they experience it. So it's a long one sentence poem. The poem just goes on and on and on. Then she came and then the, the words, the Tamil words, if you know Tamil, Vandan, Vandan, Vandan. This is how he came. Vandan, Vandan, Vandan. It ends with the word Vandan. The God came. And it starts with his dressing up. It's the most beautiful description. It's in my book. He, um, they, they wake him up in the morning and they put on these earrings and they put on the jewelry and dress him in silks. You know how they dress the gods and the bronze images. Probably one of the best descriptions in Tamil that I have seen. It's very lovely. And again, you know, Tanjavur dance, Savini Ramanave, I'll just um, do a tiny bit maybe, if I can get this thing to... Friend, tell my lord to come to me. He's no ordinary king. He's verily Brihadishwara of Tanjavur, dwelling on earth. It is actually dedicated to Sarfoji himself. I'm unable to make this thing move. So you're not going to hear it. But the dance traditions are well known. I will skip them. The Kuravanji is something worth dwelling on. He created a whole platform for the Devadasis to dance there annually. Kuravanji dramas had been, uh, had been written and orally sung and performed their musical operatic dramas in many temples, starting with Kutralam in 1718. And I shouldn't say starting because the Marathas had already written Kuravanjis before the Kutralam one. And the earliest Kuravan, one of the earliest Kuravanjis is Shahaji II's Yageshwar Kuravanji in Tamil. Maratha ruler uh, patronizing for the great old ancient Tiruvaru temple, Yageshwar Kuravanji. Yageshwar is the name of the god in Tiruvaru temple, which is a few kilometers from Tanjavu towards the coast. So uh, that Kuravanji was for uh, Yageshwar. This one is for Sarfoji and Pradeshwara. This becomes the one that supplants that one because it's performed publicly on this platform and Sarfoji is making this such a famous temple. So here are the Devadasis who danced well into the 1930s and beyond. Uh, and here's an actually from a video of them dancing. Um, I will skip this. There are many descriptions of processions and so on. I will skip them. And here's a wonderful company painting of that white robed Sarfoji. This time he's going to Kashi, to Banaras. He took a three-year pilgrimage, two and a half year pilgrimage to Kashi, because once again, for religious purposes, you may travel. So and uh, so the British let him go to all the places in between, to Guntur, Nalur, uh, Nalur uh, to Kalahasti, and then on, way, on, on the way to Calcutta and everywhere. So he really made the best of it. He never went to Europe, although he was immersed in the enlightenment. Such was his fate. 
Um, these are some of the Kuravanji revivals in Madras in recent times. I want to now get to the last two segments, the Marathi history and the Devanagari inscription, about which I have already said something. I want to show how Sarfoji is projected himself as a Maratha. And what was the reason? A simple one. The Marathas were by that time the last power opposing the British. And they, I mean, by Sarfoji's time, in a few years hence, they were defeated. By 1818, they were all finished. Uh, Kolkar and Shinde were holding up, but uh, they were defeated, right? The Marathas, the so-called Confederacy, was fighting the British. Deepu Sultan fell. So after that, they thought they had taken over all of India. The Marathas were, had already penetrated in the in northeast and northwest everywhere and the far south, and they were still holding out. So there is a way in which the Kojis, this is a famous iconographic convention of 18th century European portraiture. You point at the thing that means the most to you. He's pointing at his sword. Of course, he's a kind of defanged cobra, if you could call him that. He has no, I mean, what does this sword mean? I mean, who's he going to fight? He's sitting in his golden cage, you know, uh, writing poetry and things like that, but he still shows his, and he's shown with his minister, who is, you know, shown worshipping him. Very early on, he does this. And even now in the Tanjur Palace, that's why I asked if Avantika were there, this is outside her house, you know, Shivaji, Chhatrapati Shivaji is there. And uh, these are Modi documents and they have significance. Administrative documents in Marathi were widespread in Tamil Nadu and accountants came mainly from those who were not writing in Persian were writing in Marathi in this cursive script called Modi. All the palace records in Tanjavur are in Modi script. These are in these bundles. But all over South India, Marathi records were used in the Modi language. So Marathi was an important language and Sarfoji is capitalizing on that. Uh, I should, uh, I somehow missed out on Bhradishwara Mahatmya, the Purana. I want to say a couple of words about it before I end up with this. The Purana was itself not about the Bhradishwara alone. It was about all the temples of the Kaveri Delta and beyond. But it said that every temple was built uh, by Chola monarchs, which is patently untrue because you know that Tirumala Nayaka expanded Madurai and Madurai was built by Pandyan kings. So why are they calling everybody Chola? Because this Kaveri Delta pundits, these Purana authors in the, 17th, in the 18th century, want to promote the idea of Chola, this historical memory of Cholas. And they say, anybody who cannot build a temple should renovate a temple. So Sarfoji, like a very good boy, goes and renovates Bhradishwara and he becomes a very good Chola, right? So the Bhradishwara Mahatmya is very proud of it. He gets it translated into Tamil and gives it to Colin Mackenzie, the, the collector of Indic manuscripts and later surveyor of India, surveyor general, and this is very early, 1800 or so, Sarfoji hands over these translations. He also hands over translations of the Bhosele Vamsha Charitra, which is the genealogical history that he had written by Babu Rao Chitnis, the Brahmin scribe, Maratha scribe, Marathi scribe, and that is also given over to Colin because he's hedging his bets. He wants to be a Tamil Chola monarch and he wants to be a Maratha monarch. He doesn't give up on anything. The the Purana's importance is it gives him the Chola model of Karikala, this quotation mark Karikala Chola, who built the temple. And of course, nobody knows who built the temple because the inscription hadn't been deciphered. So it's a Chola monarch. So Sarfoji does all the things that Chola monarch would have done. Have inscriptions, do this, do that, go on pilgrimage and everything. And he does everything. And he puts even more inscriptions. This is in the Tanjapureshwara temple in Marathi. He also had Tamil inscriptions. Here's Babaji Bosley, senior prince in 2005, welcoming me. And there I am starting my second part of my research. And uh, his last bit, uh, I want to talk about, there's a question and I want to just pause here and put it in front of you, not answer it, although I've tried to do it in my writing. Who was the audience of this Marathi inscription? Uh, first, written as a history and given to Colin Mackenzie, then inscribed on the walls. Who could read it? It's as illegible to most of the people, you and I are walking over there, but well, I can read Marathi. 
But if you don't know Devanagari and you can't, it's in Devanagari, by the way. If you don't know Devanagari, which most of them didn't, even Sanskrit was written in the Grantha script, not in Devanagari. So Tamil Pandits would not know Devanagari. They usually use Grantha. Only the Marathas used uh, Devanagari and the North Indians did. So this odd inscription thrown on the walls, not very publicly because it's in the colonnade, not in the public side. But if you walk behind the lingas, you see them. And you see, oh my gosh, there's Devanagari here. What is it saying? Shivaji, Mosle, this, that, and the other. So the Bakhar histories of the Marathas were one way, they were called Bakhars. The histories that the Marathas were writing at this time were part of their resistance to the British and showing them their, their own power by showing how historically important they were. So Sarkoji is also imitating the Marathas by writing a Bakhar history for his own lineage. It hadn't been done before. Uh, he goes beyond Shivaji himself and goes to the ancient Maloji, all those generations. The other thing here that he did was um, even though Shivaji's own history was translated in various ways, the Shiva Bharata Charita of Paramananda was translated, that he didn't stop there. He went well beyond for a genealogy for himself. So I just want to say that this was his way of telling the British that he was still an important person and he shouldn't be treated like a Zaminda, that he was a king. And the last thing is his negotiations with colonial um, powers. Menorah is his memorial to the Allied victory over Napoleon in 1814. He puts quick five language inscription, out of which I've given you just two panels. Uh, his Highness Maharaja Sarfoji, Raja of Tanjore, the friend and ally of the British government, erected this column to commemorate the triumph of the British arms and the downfall of Bonaparte in 1814. He had not completely fallen down. He had one more year to live, but Sarfoji was already celebrating it. There's a Tamil uh, translation of that, or the Persian, the Persian, Telugu, and Marathi. So the, the Bradishwara is now a monument, an object, and an object of antiquity for Sarfoji. He appreciates Thomas and William Daniel. He owned all volumes of the Daniels very early. These were very expensive volumes and he owned every single Daniel volume that, as they were being published. So this was very interesting. And he owned paintings. He um, also encouraged artists to paint the Bharadishwara. And he himself sent draft drawings of temples in Tamil Nadu commissioned uh, to Indian artists who had learnt draftsmanship from Europeans. So here's the Sarangapani temple in Kumbakona sent to the Royal Asiatic Society, and this is circa 1818, sent by Sarfoji. It is now in the Royal Institute of British Architects collection, where there, another set of them, copies, were sent by his son Shivaji in, 18, in the 1840s after his father's death. So there are two sets which are available there of drafts drawings, and this is a rather odd one of the British word, and the perspective is not particularly good, but uh, it's, it's a draftsman, Indian draftsman, trying to, and there's a, a famous image of the bull. This was sent by Shivaji, but Sarfoji had already sent in 1804 to Lord Valencia, who was visiting him on February 2nd and 3rd, 1804. He sent a drawing of the bull, and he tells the story of the toad in the bull's thigh. We read in Tanjur Puran, which is the Brihadishwara Mahatmya of history, that this bull was then growing, which by order of the Chola Raja, the architect searched and found some water with a terai, which is a kind of toad, or lean frog in the thigh of the bull, and he took it out, and then the growing was stopped, the sound of which is still in the thigh. Even today they'll tell you, the guide will tell you, if you tap on the bull's thigh, you will find a hollow sound, the place where the terai or toad was, this is an oral legend which was thrust into the Bradishwara Mahatma into Sanskrit and then retold by Sarfoji in English to an Englishman, which is really the most wonderful set of uh, translations, uh, I think. And uh, uh, I guess there's one last point I wanted to make about it. history. He knew that Colin Mackenzie and the British disliked myth. Puranas are myth and Marathi histories are history. English histories are even better history. So Sarfoji, once again, was showing that he understood all these distinctions, 
Nevertheless, he wanted to valorize each of these things as having a particular significance in a particular context. And that's why he said that he also knew that Colin McKenzie was one of the Orientalists who appreciated both myth and history. So that was why he gave him both the Marathi history and the uh, Sanskrit Purana and the Tamil translation of it. So my last word on this. This is the ruined uh, Tanjore after 1869. This is Samuel Bourne, who was another photographer. Photographers came to, after the 1855, they came to India, 37, India to take pictures, the Lucknow, you know, ruined Lucknow, ruined Delhi, ruined everything. India is in ruins, right? Beautiful, picturesque ruins. But for Indians and for Sephardi, certainly, it was, he made it into a living temple, not a royal dead shrine where nobody came, but now it is a UNESCO monument and it still continues to be a heritage living shrine for most people. Thank you very much. Is there time for questions, I hope? Yeah. Yes, sir. You got a mic there, please. Thank you for the great session. If uh, the Marathas or Sarfoji to invoke uh, Cholas and why why did the Nayakas not do it? They did. They did in a way. But it's interesting uh, when it comes to temples, because I'm only talking about the temple as an icon, right? Um, that is, they, they certainly, they the great bull was built by a Nayaka. I mean, the great bull was established by a Nayaka. So Subramanya temple was, they certainly worshipped there. All the, all the royals worshipped there. But their central shrines were things where they, they went to Managuri. Rajagopala Swami was their great, uh, and, and some of the earlier Nayakas, like Sevapa Nayaka, he was a great Shaiva. So he made some uh, Im improvements to the, or you know, additions to the Brahadishwara temple. But uh, he also went to the far shrines like Tiruvannamalai, the great shrines of the Kaveri Delta uh, and beyond in Tondai Nadu and elsewhere. There are all these Nadu divisions of Tamil Nadu. So there's Tonde Nadu, um, you know, and, and uh, well, Chora Nadu, Pandya Nadu and so on, Madurai. And another thing was from Krishnadeva Raya's time onwards, they had penetrated down south and that's how the Nayakas came, right, south? But before they, if they were even independent, Raya himself had made a pilgrimage to the great, particularly Vaishnava shrines in uh, Tirunavelli, you know. He went to Arvar Tirunagari, uh, Tirukkurungudi, these are all famous temples. But some of the Pandyas and the Nayakas also patronized the great Nalayapur temple in Tirchiva, the Denkashi temple. These are all Shaiva temples. They didn't discriminate. And what about Tirumalai Nayaka who worshipped uh, Madurai? I mean, he, he was the one who made the Meenakshi temple what it is today. So they were, and of course, Tirupati was important, Chandragiri was important, Kalanasti was important for the Nayakas. But locally for the Tanjavur Nayakas, Manarudi Rajagopala Swami became very important in the later period, uh, when the final period before the Marathas took over. Vijaya Raghava Nayaka was Manaru Dasa, you know, he was the uh, you know, Dasa of Manarudi Rajagopala. So that was his favorite temple. Before that, Ravunatha Nayaka, the great, uh, greatest of all the Nayakas in Tanjavur, uh, his minister, uh, Govinda Dikshita, uh, enhanced the Kumbakonam temple, built also a Rama shrine. So there is a great deal of Shaiva and Vaishnava activity going here. Somehow, oops, sorry. Somehow Raja Raja's temple, uh, it was a good temple, it was the local temple, it was important. But remember they had all of the Chola realm, whereas Sarpoji had this. That is the main point, I think. I don't know. Oh, Amantika, are you here? Did you hear any of it? Yes. Great. Well, your father's photo was there. And do you remember Maya and we visiting back then? I think it was 2005 and 2009. It was very nice. So, so good to see you. So good that you came. Please tell your father that I'm sorry he couldn't come. We talked last night, but uh, that, that I, you know, mentioned him. That would be very nice. And thanked him right at the beginning. I don't know if you were there. Right. Yeah. And we'll talk a little later. I wonder if you could join us for dinner. I would really like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, if 
he was only a figurehead king. Where did his funding come from, uh, from to do all this? Who's asking? Oh, that, yeah, it's a good question. I didn't have time to mention it. He got a very generous pension. Michael Fisher, who's written a major book on um, indirect rule in India, it was one of the first books on the subsidiary alliance system where residents were residents were thrust into, you know, and given official positions and how it evolved from, you know, just their supervising activities to really dictating everything that they did. And of course, throughout their surveillance. But what matters is that if you have money, you're allowed to do certain cultural, end quote, uh, 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 activities. So that would have encouraged him. He had a very generous pension. Michael Fisher pointed out in a table that uh, even the king of Delhi had a lower pension than Sarfoji. One-fifth of the Tanjore revenue, Tanjore was a rice bowl. This is why the British wanted it. They, were, they made them into subsidiary allies because of political dissensions and then took over all the revenues of Tanjore. And Sarfoji's deal was that he gave over the revenues of Tanjore, then he could be king and get a one-fifth pension. And, and some of the, I mean, sorry, one-fifth of the revenue and a generous pension. I don't remember the figures, I'm not very good with figures, but it was very good. Yes. I'm sure. He's done very good. Yeah, very good. Yes. Uh, thanks again. Great. Yes, uh, James. Very interesting uh, mm -hmm. talk. Um, the 108 Minka, you mentioned, I think, that the, the, their worship had lapsed. Yes. And it's very fascinating to know why and how. Um, because there are some temples where perhaps inauspicious things have happened or they were uh, they were in inaccessible places and maybe under one dynasty or one village, you know, villages moved away because of famine and they la their worship had lapsed because the village was deserted, right? That happened even during the Hyder Ali period when there was this horrible famine. Schwartz helped feed people during the Hyder Ali famine, uh, you know, so that kind of temple. But also, they mention, by this term, they talk about very ancient Chola monuments which are hidden in the bushes or something like that. And Kudavail Balasubramanyam, one of the fine scholars, epigraphists and temple scholars from Tanjau, uh, he's associated, been associated with the Saraswati Mahal Library for a very long time, archaeologist and writer. He argues that they all came from a place called 108 Lingas, which is an actual temple, which was where the worship had lapsed. I'm not entirely sure of all of this, but in the poem, they say it was brought from various parts of Chora Nadu, so I don't know what the decision I should make. Oh, the mic? Oh, yeah. Uh, it was absolutely right. fascinating. I visited this temple and the Maratha Museum exactly okay. one month ago. Wonderful. <laughs> Avantika, yeah. were you there or yeah. were you yeah. in yeah. You were in Bangalore. No. Right. I, I was told that the Nayakas were telephones. Yes, they were. And uh, Sarfoji, of course, was. Maratha. The question that came to my mind there was why was this part of the country ruled by non local kings? Very interesting question. Uh, I think that it was the richness of the revenues of Tanjava. The British also wanted to, they were also non local kings. The point is that this was a prize for contention. And the Vijayana, the Nayakas were. People who branched off from Vijayanagara, they went to Keri, to um, Jinji, to Chandragiri, to Tanjava. Tanjava was the richest prize of all. It was the place. And at this time, there is further, I mentioned in my other talk about the migrations, which I couldn't go into. The Telugu warriors and Maravars from the south and the Setupatis who had the pearl fisheries in Rameshwaram and Ceylon who were contending with the Dutch, all of these people were fighting over small territories. The Setupatis of Rameshwaram were fighting with the Tanjavur Maratha. Shahji had uh, dissensions with them. Um, but they, you know, and everybody wanted the pearl fisheries, everybody wanted the rice revenue. So whoever could get a small fragmented kingdom was con was not content with that. But anyone who could, who could get Tanjavur had so much money, so, and, and Shulman and Narayanara have shown, and Subhrubramanyam have shown, Economically, they were rife with cash. They were flowing in cash, right? That's what they say. And that's brilliant. The Marathas were not rife with cash. 
they had to deal with other kinds of capital, but they had the rice revenue. So that was very important for them. The Kaveri was the mother. The Kaveri plays a very important part. In the Maratha times, it, it acquires even greater significance. At NIAS, I spoke about Ganga Kaveri Sambhag, which was one of the great Sharda. Well, it's one of the great plays of Shahaji's time because without, you know, because the North Indians are asking, why are you worshipping this Kaveri river? And they say, uh, Shiva himself, Panchanadishwara himself comes and says, Ganga and Kaveri are equal. I put Ganga on the north so that she could, uh, you know, uh, give sustenance to the North Indians. And I put Kaveri in the south so she could be the great, you know, great mother for you all. So the Marathas were very aware of their great good luck. Yeah, well, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm drawing the right parallels, but I think the similar case of an emergence of a temple happened in the late, uh, I think in, uh, in Trivandrum, like yes. Amir Tirnal Martanda Varma also, yes. Yes. it was a spiritual political act that he yeah. had brought again yeah. a life to the temple, mm -hmm. uh, claiming a legitimacy exactly at that time when he was also engaging with modernity. Right. Right. We should see this histori historical fact in the same perspective of they come in contact with modernity and claiming another legitimacy, a spiritual and religious legitimacy. No, I do do that. I do do that. I just couldn't present all of that here. I mean, it's very fully contextualized. And I know all the work of all the people who wrote on that. I'm not defending, I'm just saying that it's, yes, I completely agree with you. It's not a defensive statement. I completely agree with you. In fact, in my paper, I've written about also North India. In the time of the Mughals and the Rajputs, the Rajputs were doing similar things. Mewar, for example, Jaipur, for example, Jaipur and the great gentleman, you know, this was all standing up to the other power. And uh, this is a pattern of legitimacy. Uh, people like Sheldon Pollock argue that legitimacy isn't a good word, it's not a good concept. But I don't know what else to call it because they are sort of establishing themselves as upstart rulers in a strange place, and they have to, I agree with you. And Marpanda Varma has been written about greatly, first by Mary Beth Heston, she wrote about the temple. This was about 35 years ago, she has a great article on the temple. And then uh, recently Manu Pillai, the book, there's the other book which I put there is the 13, um, 13 temples. Manu Pillai starts with Padman Padmanabha temple. So it's really an, uh, absolutely correct that they were in when they are in contact with modernity, they are definitely doing this. But there are also earlier patterns of such legitimacy happening in India. So that's all I wanted to add to your very pertinent comment. Thank you, sir. Did you want to add anything no. to that? I'd be I'd welcome it. Unless someone else has, yeah. And the late Mughals also became the late Mughals also became increasingly ceremonial, I think, in their Ritual. Completely, and then the British became increasingly ceremonial and competing with the with the Indian princes because the, you know they were trying to make the princely states into their own images, but the princely states went one up on them in various ways, making the British into their own images. So these are the sorts of things that I'm very interested in. Absolutely, both of your comments are very very important because you have to see this as a larger pattern. Absolutely, indeed. Thank you so much for bringing to life to, uh, this whole world of Sir Fuji II and the Tanjavu Temple for us. I think we all feel like we've been on a big, massive ceremonial procession through the literature, architecture, art, history, music uh, of that time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.